I spent too much time in my world of escape, and now I was forced to endure every moment of this pain, counting every drop of his sweat that falls on me, feeling every time my head hits the leather arm of the couch, and wondering, when will he be done so I can run away? I was consumed by thoughts, recounting each time he had raped me and the moments leading up to it. I wondered if what was happening to me was my fault. He was not the first, but I prayed he was the last. I forced myself to be a martyr. I had already died many times over, but maybe in sacrificing myself this time, it's for a good cause. Maybe I could save his girlfriend from some of the harsh blows she faced from a man who was supposed to be my brother. Wow. Yeah, that one, that took a lot out of me to write. <laughs> really? Yeah, definitely. It was, um, it was one of those things that, that kind of, I never really had the words for it, but whenever I would talk about him, I would always just say, the name that we do not use or that man that my mother had or something to that nature, just because I was like, I didn't know how to talk about him without giving him a name, but without also giving him the title of being my brother, because mm -hmm. as a sibling or as a brother, relative, whatever the relationship is, you don't do that to people, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So what do you call him now? Um, honestly, I don't know. I really just, it's more of like a general census, but because I have so many siblings, sometimes I'll just say the man that my mother had. Um, but I know that's kind of a long phrase. <laughs> I, got you. I got you. That's okay. That's totally, we know who we're talking about though. Yeah. Okay. What was your childhood like? Um, my childhood was one that was filled of sadness, fear, um, agony, I guess, just mm -hmm. things that aren't good. Um, I became a mother at a young age, oddly enough, um, sleep, sleepless nights, just, I don't know, it, it, it's really hard to describe, but I guess to kind of sum it all up, nothing good. I had good moments, but outside of that, like, it wasn't good until um, 2002, 2003, when I moved away from the first part of my childhood to when I turned about nine, my childhood got better. What is the age difference between you are talking about? Um, so the age difference is probably about anywhere from like 10 to 15 years, I think. Okay. Oh, wait. Actually, if I was 13 and he was 33, what is that? 20 years? 20 years? Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a huge gap. Very much so. Okay. So okay. Long, be, long beyond the point of knowing better. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So what caused you to go to live with him? So when I was about 13, well, um, a little further back, I guess, when I was seven, my mother passed away. Okay. Um, so from there, I, when I was about eight years old, I moved in with my auntie. Um, and I refer to her as my auntie mom when I'm talking to other people. But when I'm talking to her, obviously, it's just mom. Okay. Um, so I moved in with my auntie mama. And at that time, I was about nine years old. And she would always tell me about my mother. And a lot of things such as, oh, your mother was on drugs, she was a prostitute, she, you know, you were a crack baby, things like that. But that kind of, that type of talk started when I was eight. Um, so when I was nine, or when I was 13 or so, um, it became, it got to a point where I was just tired of it. Mm -hmm. um, I was in middle school, I started making friends with the kids in the neighborhood, which I rode the bus with often. And it just, it was one particular incident where um, I was talking to her about my grades. I was so excited because I was making A's and B's and she was like, you could do better, but I'm proud of you anyway. Um, you know, your mother never made it out of middle school. She was on drugs. She had a baby young, just kind of 
going over the same story that I heard, you know, pretty much all the time that I've been with her. And mm -hmm. I was just so sick of it. And I was just, I went to school one day and I was, um, I was venting to my friends in the neighborhood because we all went to the same school together and they also lived across the street from me. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say things like, oh, I wish you would die. I just want her. I wish her and my mom could trade, trade places. Um, if she died, I wouldn't cry. Things like that. Just really mean things because I was hurt. And I just felt like she was the one that was hurting me. So I just, I didn't know how else to say it or even how to express it to her. So instead, I expressed it to my friends. But okay. with, with me expressing it to my friends, I guess they went back and told their mom. And this was like over maybe a three or four month time period. Mm -hmm. And when the summer came around, I came home from swimming with some of my cousins. And before I knew it, you know, I got called into the room and she was upset. And she started telling me about what their mom said and basically regurgitating all the things that I told them. And mm -hmm. her feelings was hurt, understandably so. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand. Um, I was too scared to really speak on anything or to clarify anything or even to defend myself. Mm -hmm. So that's a point where she said, you know what? I took you in when nobody else would. What, you know, let's see who 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 wants you, um, because obviously you don't want to be with me. Okay. Um, and she started calling all of my siblings and none of them wanted to take me except from one. And he said, you know, I don't have a lot, but you can come live with me if you want to. Um, and I just said, OK. And come to find out the commerce. Uh, and from that point, from me talking to him to me talking to her about me leaving, um, our conversation kind of went like, oh, well, I don't, um, you know, well, you can go live with this person. They said that they'll take you in. Um, and again, because I'm scared and I'm just so, I'm 13. I don't, I, you know, I don't know what to say because I know I don't want to leave. I was just hurt. I just, my mm -hmm. feelings were hurt. But mm -hmm. now that you're telling me, you know, let's see who else wants you and you're calling all of my siblings. Now I feel like, well, the choice has been made for me. So there mm -hmm. was no need for me to say, well, I don't want to leave, you okay. know? Okay. Um, and from there, I, I ended up leaving. Um, within two months or within a month, actually, I ended up okay. leaving within a month. I left in July of 2007. 2007. And at that time you were 13, 13, 13. Yep. 13. Okay. And then um, once you got there, what was it like? Um, was, it happy, was it ever happy times there? So the first day was, was really fun. Um, he came to pick me up from the airport. I immediately recognized him and he took me to Denny's to go get some food. I'd never been to Denny's before, so I was excited. He started telling me about the city that we were living in, he took me to go get coffee. And I was just bragging about um, Seattle's coffee. I think it's this restaurant's called Seattle's Best or something like that. But they have okay. coffee in the city, apparently. OK, um, so I was excited. I went and got some coffee and we just talked and we spoke about um as siblings, our biggest thing is having a sibling reunion where we all get back together and we all reunite. So how many siblings? Uh, apparently, there's 13, but there's only 11 of us that we really know of, I guess. Okay. 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 Um, and sometimes the, the number changes. It's more, it's less. We we don't really know, but we know it's, it's a lot of us. Okay. Okay. Um, so we talked about having a sibling reunion and we're like, you know, we're one step closer because I live with you now and the rest of them are all in California. So it'll be easy. Um, and then, you know, he took me to his house and I met his girlfriend. I met the baby. Um, from there, we left the house again and he took me to Radio Shack to go get a phone so that, you know, because they both worked and it was still summertime. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted me to be able to contact them if I needed anything while they were gone. So I was excited. I never had a phone before. They were like, you know, because when I was living with my auntie mama, they didn't think that I needed a phone because I'd go to school, come home. And then on top of that, I didn't really have any friends. And the few friends that I did have lived in the neighborhood and we all lived within walking distance of each other. Okay. So I was excited. Something new, something better, you know. 
Um, and then by the second day, everybody left, went to work. I was home alone. Um, I had brought my PlayStation with me and I was up in my room and I was playing the game. I had my own room. The baby slept in the room with them. So from there, um, he called me, asked me if I wanted anything. He got me some Wendy's, got me one of those chocolate shakes. And uh, he came home and we sat in my room and we played video games. And he talked about um, jujitsu and MMA, which is he said that he wanted to be a fighter. So I was like, okay, that's cool. Um, and he started telling me about all these different um, wrestling moves or jujitsu moves and MMA moves. And then he was like, here, I'll show you. From there, he started showing me all the different moves, the wrestling moves and stuff like that. And because um, sexual assault is was the situation with him wasn't the first time of sexual assault. So for me, um, I, I guess I already developed PTSD with it. So anytime I encounter a man, I'm always thinking, OK, is he going to do something to me? It doesn't matter who the man is, if I've known him all my life or if you've never done anything to me. There's always this fear in the back of my mind of this could be the day. So I was while we were going through some of the moves, I was having that fear. And then all of a sudden, it was just like one minute we're wrestling. And then before I knew it, he was taking my pants off. So I wasn't even there a full 24 hours before um, the, before I, I began being raped and molested on a consistent basis. Um, so pretty much the first day was the only real happy day. So, <laughs> and how long were you there? Um, I was there for about almost a year because I actually got there in July and I think I left in like towards the end of June the next year. So it was almost a full year, but within me being there for about, so if I got, I got there in July. Um, by, I want to say May of the following year, he ended up getting arrested for assaulting his girlfriend's sister's boyfriend. That's a mouthful, I know, but <laughs> okay, I got it. Um, okay. Long story short, he got he assaulted somebody and um, he got arrested for it. But because he already had a criminal background, they took him in. There was no bail, and he had to have a court hearing. So. From there, it was like the last month or two of my school year, and pretty much we were free, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, I won't say it was a happy time, but it was definitely a, a time of feeling a, a level of freedom. So. Okay. so as a child, when you were with your auntie mama, did you ever have any counseling or therapy just with your mom passing and living with someone um, else? Did you ever do any counseling? So when I was in the fifth grade, so when we moved to uh, Texas, I want to say, she did end up putting me in therapy. Um, and that lasted for a short while because the therapist said, you know, hey, you know, she seems fine. She seems really good. Um, I don't really see a reason for her to come back to therapy. You know, she seems well established. Um, and then from there, I, I started going to another program. It's called Rainbow Something. But basically, it was like a in school. It was like another um, class where we got to go on our free period. And basically, they met like once or twice a week. And we would have like group therapy with our classmates. Um, but of course I never really disclosed anything and I never, um, I never really shared a lot. Um, I think one of the most memorable things that I remember from that group was, you know, the, the instructor having a bottle of soda and she shook it up and she said, these are our feelings. And sometimes when you, when you hold your feelings in for a really long time, it's like this bottle and you open it and it explodes. So she, you know, she kind of walked us through how to kind of tame our feelings. And I just remember feeling like that's me to a T. That's exactly how I feel. Mm -hmm. But I didn't understand why I felt that way. So Okay. And during those times, that's when you were with your auntie mama, right? Yes. Uh, okay. So during that time, did you have behaviors in school? 
or did um, you quote unquote act out as they say? Um, no. Um, no. for the most part, I was a really good kid. I always got okay. complimented on how well behaved I was, how well, um, how how well I spoke to people. A lot of times I gravitated up more towards adults and they were always so shocked at the level of conversation that I would have with them. Okay. Um, because for some reason I didn't get along with kids my age. And even when it came to my younger cousins, it always ended up being a level of um, controversy, I guess, for lack of a better word, because we just, we will always get into it, but that kind of got chalked down to, oh, kids being kids, they're not going to always agree. Mm -hmm. They always fight. It's just kids being kids type of thing. Um, but to some degree, I real as an adult, I realized that some of the behaviors that I had with them, it was because I finally got to have something that was mine and nobody, and I felt like nobody could take that away from me because I grew up with other kids all the time, but mm -hmm. now to essentially be the only child, now that there's other children, I, I guess I, I became territorial in a sense, okay. um, but not, not mean or not a bully to any degree, but just more so of, I was more emotional when they were around versus just being happy that they were around. Okay. Now moving on to who we're talking about. When you went to school, when you were living there and you went to school, were there any behaviors in school? Now, um, you're already going through all of this on what he's doing. Did right. that come out during school? Go like um express yourself in any kind of way? Not with him. No. Um, when he was around, I, I, I was well behaved. I went to school. I did what I was supposed to do. Um, brought home good grades all the time. The, but I will say, I believe the, the time that my behavior changed was when he went to jail. And that so looked like, you know, when, because it was just me and his girlfriend, you know, I, at some point, I basically was an in-home babysitter, and I didn't like that very much because at 14, I want to go hang out with my friends, but I can't. So when I was with her and it was just us, um, she would call me and say something to me, and I would just mock her, and I would be like, well, just kind of no real respect. It was just like, a, I'm ignoring you, but I'm letting you know that I'm ignoring you, and I'm going to just say your name because you said my name. Um, okay. Or... I got, let's see, I got in trouble at school because I got into a fight, but that was just because of, you know, drama. And I just, I didn't care. I was just like, okay, this is what this is. I don't care. There's nobody that's going to do anything to me when I get home. I'm going to fight this person. She wants mm -hmm. to fight me. I'm going to fight her back. Um, I also went through this, the phase of kind of sneaking out of the house at night and um, and what else did I do? Oh, and after that, during the summertime, I tried to join a gang. I don't know what my little self was going to do, but really? I tried to join a gang. <laughs> yeah, but okay. um, I think definitely divine intervention because around the time that I was talking about joining a gang, I ended up calling my auntie mama and I was asking her for money. And she just asked the question, well, where is he at? And I explained, I was like, oh, he's in jail because of X, Y, Z. And she was like, so who are you living with? And I said, his girlfriend. And he was, she was like, no, ma'am, you're coming home because mm -hmm. I sent you to live with him and not with her. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. But even then, I still never told her what was going on or that I even expressed the thought of wanting to go home. Because at that time, I was enjoying my freedom. And I was like, you're not taking that from me. But when she told me I was going home, I was like, okay, I'll come home. Okay. So were there any signs, like relatives, teachers, neighbors, anybody? Were there any signs that someone could have seen? Um, honestly, no. No? Okay. I was I was good in school. He put on the best facade ever. Okay. Um, and, I mean, that was pretty much it. There okay. was nothing. So. And why did you not feel like um, you were safe enough to tell anyone? 
Well, so with his girlfriend, I I got to witness him um, abuse her. So he he would beat her, he would berate her, um, and I felt like at some point it could happen to me if I spoke up. Um, I mean, he's six one or six foot and like a little over two fifty, I guess. So he's a big guy. Okay. Um, and I remember there was an incident where I guess his girlfriend lost her job. He lost his job. Nobody was working. And we were all just sitting in the, in the living room and um, they were sitting on the porch uh, in, in the sliding door so that the house didn't fill up with cigarette smoke. Mm -hmm. And we were all just talking and he was like, you know, well, excuse my French, but he said, um, there's three B's in this house. Y'all need to start contributing. And then I made the comment, well, I do contribute. And I remember this big guy stand up, like he stood up so fast to the point where I wasn't even paying attention enough to really react, except for when he was over me and I just looked up and he says, um, well, how do you contribute? But in, a, in the like in an angry tone, like he's never been angry at me. So to hear him direct that anger towards me, it was kind of shocking and I was confused. Mm -hmm. um, and then he just says, well, how do you contribute or whatever? And I, and I just remember thinking, oh my God, I'm sitting on the floor, he's standing up, he kicked me in my face if he wanted to. And I don't know if he told me he would kick me in my face or if I'm just, if I just, I was so convinced that, that would, that's what was going to happen, that that's the memory that I have. But that was like, it was so much fear. And I was just like, okay, never mind. You're right. I don't contribute, you know, but I felt like me watching the baby was enough. And apparently it was not. So. Okay. Okay. So are there any triggers um, by certain things that may trigger you now? Like, how do you manage those? Um, A lot of my triggers are associated due to some of the um the older traumas that i held when i was younger so mm -hmm. like if even if somebody's playing and they try to like throw me in a dark room and then close the door that's a trigger for me um mm -hmm. because i'm 27 and i'm still afraid of the dark so i sleep with the tv on at night um or there, there might be little things where if I see somebody that looks similar to him, um, mm -hmm. that kind of triggers me a little bit. And Or even something as simple as thinking about my childhood will trigger me just because mm -hmm. the only thing that I can think about is wishing that I would have spoke up sooner or even to the point of thinking like, well, what could I have done differently? And that will usually send me into a rabbit hole of just abyss because there's no... There's no way of me knowing what would have happened to me or anyone around me had I said something and spoke up. Right. So it's just one of those things where a lot of times I don't come out of the triggers and I'll sit there and I'll bask in it and I'll be sad and I'll, you know, start to swirl into, you know, a level of depression. And um, sometimes I, I can't always say that there's a, there's a way out, mm -hmm. but then other times I guess the way that I cope with it is I'll make myself busy. So whether that's cleaning, working on an art project, gardening, um, reading a book, and, and then from there I can kind of be okay. okay. Um, or even just, which it's, this particular thing is a little, um, it's a little odd. So like, I really like murder mysteries. So like the ID channel and like listening to other people go through things and stuff like that. Like it's, mm -hmm. I guess it's one of those things that reminds me that I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. uh, even though that's very like a dark way to, to, to mm -hmm. get to that point. But it reminds me that I'm not alone in the things that I've gone through. And, and sometimes like it helps to bring me back to reality to let me know that, you know, everybody goes through something, but without diminishing how I feel about it. And That's why support groups are so helpful. Yeah. And I agree because um, I think my biggest issue with talking to people and trying to get, even if it's just to vent or to get something off my chest, 
the biggest issue is when people say, oh, well, you know, there's kids in Africa starving, you know, you're not the only person that has issues, you know, and it's kind of like, that may be true, but I want to, I'm trying to feel what I'm feeling so I can get through it because I'm tired of feeling like this or it's weighing really heavy on me. So for you to kind of just say, well, you're not the only person who goes through that is very diminishing and it creates a, a toxic cycle of just, you know, continuing to go around it because then it becomes a thought process of, well, why do I feel like this? I know I'm not the only person going through this, but the TV can't talk back. Right. You know, right. Just hear the story and then that's it. So. What does your healing process look like now? Um, as of now, my healing process is really just protecting my daughter without being overbearing, mm. um, teaching her all the things that I wish I was taught at a young age, because I feel mm. like if I was taught that, you know, nobody's supposed to touch you in certain places. And when somebody did, I would have been able to say, OK, well, you know, this person did this. This is it. you said mm. it's not OK. Mm -hmm. um, where and whereas, you know, before I would not even say anything, but I would see other people or other kids get in trouble for something and everybody gets a woman or everybody gets in trouble. And it's, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like, okay, well, why would I say something? I'm just going to get in trouble anyway. So I might as well keep it to myself. But I teach my daughter that, you know, tell me what happened. Like, let me know, like, even if it's something that she did bad that she should get in trouble for, I still mm -hmm. try to just talk her through it versus talk at her. Mm -hmm. Um, and in a way that kind of makes me feel better because it gives me the confidence that one day my daughter, she's going to grow up and she's going to feel comfortable enough to talk to me and let me know if something does happen and know that I, I will always side with her. Because as a child, anybody in the right mind wouldn't think, OK, well, they're just lying about this because as a child, you don't know about sex. That's mm -hmm. not the thing that's on your forefront. So to lie and say that somebody touched you inappropriately it doesn't make sense as a, right. you know, a small child. Right. Um, so between that and also just writing my book um, mm -hmm. and my boyfriend also, he's, he honestly, he is like the best support system that I have because he let me know, like I told him the story one day and he was like, and I was just like, oh yeah, I'm okay. You know, this happened, but I'm okay. And he was like, no, you're not. You're you're not okay. Wow. And it was that moment where I realized I might not be okay. I might need to figure some things out. Um, so between that and writing the book, um, going to court for him and getting the guilty verdict, that was really helpful. But I also understand that not a lot of people are lucky mm -hmm. in that fashion. Yeah. Especially yeah. considering I was 22 when I went to court and that happened to me when I was 13 and 14. Wow, so that was a long time to carry that. So okay. at 22, so when did you and your boyfriend have the conversation that not okay? Um, I was 25, I want to say, when we had that conversation. Okay, so and this was after the, this was after the, the court date? Mm -hmm. Long okay. after the court date. Okay. And when did you start? When did you realize you needed help? Um, I think I always realized that I needed help, but it wasn't until 2000 and December 5th, 2017. You remember the date? <laughs> yeah. Um, because that was the day that I tried to take my life. And okay. the day before, um, I remember I took all my friends out. I paid for everything. And I was just like, this is it. But I didn't tell them that, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but that night, I ended up calling a friend because I remember having the thought, I need to call somebody because there's still something that I have to do, which was go to court. But I also knew that if I took my life that night, I wouldn't make it till then. So I made the plan to take my life after I finished with court, regardless to what the outcome was. Um, but my auntie mama was there and she stayed in the room with me the entire time. So I was like, well, that's not going to happen. Um, and so, then, okay. So wait, so the court date was the fifth? No, the court date was in February and December before then. So about 
three months prior to the court date, I was planning on taking my life because oh. I just felt so overwhelmed with everything mm -hmm. that was going on. Um, and I just didn't know how to contain it. And I didn't know how to talk to anybody. But within that process, I was kind of forced to go to therapy. And it just, it completely changed my outlook on taking my life and just understanding what it was that I went through. Even though I wasn't comfortable, I wasn't ever comfortable with talking to my therapist about what I had been through, but I would give them like a brief synopsis of everything that happened or what was happening leading up to the court date. Um, so from 2017 until now, I've kind of always been in and out of therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't been in a while, but I've definitely feel like going to therapy was definitely my, my saving grace. But mm -hmm. it takes a special type of person to really connect with you because there's mm -hmm. such a stigma behind therapy and people don't really feel like it's helpful. So. Right, right, right. Um, so at the age of 14, what was your escape from life? Like going through all that, that, that year period that you were there? Um, at 14, I didn't really register it. At 15, I had a breaking point where I was at my cousin's house babysitting for the summer and everybody was gone. The, um, the child that I was babysitting, she was sleeping and I just remember crying and just having a moment to myself of just hurt and not understanding what was wrong with me and why was everybody doing this to me. Um, and that was kind of it. I, I didn't go any further than that. Um, and then at 16, I remember um, I started doing drugs. I started popping pills. And um, I think it was then when my auntie mama decided to start taking me to therapy because she realized something wasn't quite right, but she wasn't sure what. Mm -hmm. um, so I started going to therapy at 16. And then I had, um, but prior to that, I had a mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. So, but I know a lot of that was more so because I was so close with my cousin and she was having a baby and I didn't know how to share because my cousin was that one person that I really felt like that got me and I felt like, or that understood me. And I felt like with her having a baby, her just getting married, I felt like I wasn't going to have her anymore. So I feel mm -hmm. like with dealing with what I dealt with at 14 and knowing that I have a person that is pure and really cares about me and the, the possibility of something or someone taking them away from me, it was just a big no-go for me. Really? Um, yeah. And, and then, that's when you were, you were in, you were living there with him at that time, or were you back with your auntie mama? Um, at 15 and, or at 16, I was living with my auntie mama okay. and her, uh, her daughter came down to visit one day. And that just, I chose that night to have a mental breakdown because I saw how pregnant she was and I didn't know how to ha handle it. I didn't know how to register her having another person to care for that wasn't me. Mm. So, 